So hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar entitled, Where Did You Get This? Helping Students Navigate Online Research. Uh, as you can guess, I'm not Sharon. We'll get to her in just a minute. Uh, my name is Dominique Briere. I'm a pedagogical counselor at the University of Sherbrooke, and I work for Performa. And for those of you who don't know, Performa is a network of 62 college institutions across Quebec and the University of Sherbrooke. And uh, our mission is to um, foster and help uh, college faculty develop professionally. And we do this in a number of ways. We have graduate programs in French and in English, and we also have special projects like this one. And so I'm very pleased to be today with uh, Laurelie Bouchard, who uh, steered this project with me at the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, and um, I know a lot of you know her, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and um, all, we are pleased and because we feel you're lucky. We, we're lucky, actually, to have Sharon with us. Sharon, is a, as I mentioned before, that we have graduate programs. Our, she teaches in one of our programs called the MTP program, the Master Teacher Program. Uh, she's taught uh, at the college level for a little uh, under 30 years, three decades. Uh, she's received uh, award, an award in 2020 from uh, the Ministère for Teaching Excellence. And so that's why, that's why I meant by us being lucky, having her in facilitating this webinar. Before we start and before I hand it over to you, Sharon, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, I will ask you to ask questions using either the Q&A module at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand and we will activate your mic. Please leave the chat for comments, um, sharing ideas or resources if you want, but it just, it's just going to make it easier for us to track the questions if you use the Q&A um, module or raise your hand. So um, I won't keep you waiting any, any further. Over to you, Sharon, and thank you for being with us. Thanks, thanks, Dominic. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to just share my screen again. Um, good screen too. Um, so uh, you can see this all right, everybody? Yes, yes. Great. So I'm glad that everybody is here. We had a lot of people sign up for this workshop and I know that some people uh, sign up for things and don't show up. So I'm really glad you're here. Thank you for being here with us um, to, to try and figure out how we can um, support our students in doing online research. Um, so I just need to move to the next slide. So the goal of this interactive webinar is to provide strategies for stage of teachers to support students as they improve their digital media. I know this slide is really text heavy. I promise they're not all like this. Um, I just wanted to list some of the things that we're going to do. Um, we're going to think about algorithms, cookies, filter bubbles, bias, fake news, search engines, keywords, um, libraries, and copyright and plagiarism and citing sources. And obviously, we can't do all of that in, in the next uh, hour. So there is a follow-up community of practice that's going to run for the next few months. That will include also a couple more webinars like this one, where we're hoping that we can all put our heads together and try to find, um, you know, best resources, great ideas, great pedagog pedagogical approaches to, to tackling this problem. Um, oh, so we already have a, a question. <clears throat> okay, good. <laughs> Nobody can put their camera on, so that's a that's a. It's because this is the webinar format, so don't stress about that. <clears throat> so yeah, um, when we ask, when you signed up for this workshop, you uh, <clears throat> answered the question. When I'm when I think of helping students navigate online research, I'm interested in knowing about, and you can see in that little. Um, Excel spreadsheet beside all the things that people answered. And um, I had done the PowerPoint before I looked at this list of answers and almost all of the things that people talked about are on our list. So I think this is a, a common problem for SAGEP teachers and SAGEP students. And, and um, we're all looking for ways to, to help our students get better at this. 
Um, right in the very first response, it says, we already used the crap test. And I was like, oh, what's the crap test? And I'm sure I've seen it before. And I just did a search in um, Google and you can see in the top right corner, that's just a screenshot of, there's all those different worksheets for the crap test. So which one is the best? Which one would you recommend? Which one is good for college age students? Um, if I don't have to look at 40 different worksheets, um, that's going to save time for me and make my life easier as a, as a SAGEP teacher. So one of the things we're going to try to do in this community of practice is um, crowdsource materials that are really effective for our demographic, for SAGEP students. Um, and so I'm hoping that that will be um, helpful to everyone. Uh, so I'm going to go on to the next slide. Uh, so in the research project that this uh, project is affiliated with, they're trying to um, help uh, see, see how we can better implement the digital, Quebec's digital action, uh, numérique, plan d'action numérique. And part of that is the digital competency framework that came out a few years ago. Um, by the way, all the resources in this webinar will also be posted in our community of practice on LinkedIn, as well as their, we'll put a PDF of this PowerPoint in the community of practice and the links are hot links. So you'll be able to go to anything that you can see there. Um, uh, so the, the digital competency framework is, the, you know, the, the competency is to be digitally competent, <laughs> um, but there are 12 dimensions of the digital competency that they have decided on and they are overlapping and and interwoven. So they are pictured here as distinct entities, but they're not really. We do a lot of these things and we're already doing all of these things. It's more to become aware and to make sure there's not gaps in what our students um, are able to do as digital citizens in our digital world. We like to separate the idea of uh, the real world and the digital world, but I read somebody say, who said, you know, that distinction is, is not, is not accurate our the digital world is part of our real world um how do you make an appointment to get your doctor's appointment or um where are you going shopping uh what are you doing for for fun where are we getting some of our education all of this is interfaced in a digital way so these are skills we need to have as teachers but we need to help our students get better at um so out of the 12 dimensions Information literacy is a big one, and that's what this community of practice is focusing on. I can see there's a second question. Um, are we okay? Yeah, that's just in the chat. Okay, Dominic's adding links and things in the in the chat, so you can go and look um, when you uh, see those pop up. So the fourth dimension that orange one that we looked at is called developing and mobilizing information literacy. And these are the elements. And like a good teacher, I'm not going to read them aloud to you. But like I said, this resource will be in the community practice. And it's also online in that link that you can look at. Um, these are all things that we hope that we can pass on to our, with, to our students. Um, so I just honed them down to sort of keywords to help us Think about them instead of reading out aloud all of those sentences. So the elements of developing and mobilizing information literacy are going to focus on things like selecting and using information, effective and meticulous research strategies, thinking about using all, harnessing all available resources, assessing information. Is it, is it valid? Um, where is it coming from? Adjusting research results according to what you've got and thinking, okay, this isn't enough, or I might need to change, or I might need to search for something else, and then organizing what you have. And then just in general, a reflective attitude towards information, its context. Where is it coming from? The purpose, who's who's giving, who's putting out this information? Um, and as I was looking for an image, I found this great link to um, 10 research tips uh, on TED.com. Um, that, that are really helpful. So there's tons and tons of resources, almost too much. The same way that when our students go to search for something, there's really almost too much. How do they, how do they narrow it down? Um, I'm hoping that this community of practice will help us narrow down the good stuff for, for thinking about information literacy for SAGEP students. And then the things that we teach, that we use from, 
from this um, community of practice will then help our students get better at narrowing down their information searches. So two concrete examples of dimension number four, uh, information literacy. In a learning context, the learner is able to plan and implement a research strategy to find out more about a topic for an oral presentation, for example. And in a teaching context, the teacher or non-teaching professional is able to address current events in the classroom by having learners analyze source and media credibility and deconstruct any rumors that may arise. So those are you know, things that come up all the time. I think we can picture that fairly easily. So what is this community of practice supporting source savvy students supposed to do? We're hoping that we can come together with others from the Quebec College, College Network um, who are invested in finding solutions to this specific challenge. Um, I, I'd like us to gather what are the main concerns? What are we as teachers seeing that's happening in our classroom with our students? Um, and, and by sharing that sort of preventing some of those problems or learning how to prevent them, um, how can we support students in navigating the web for academic and community purposes? And it's kind of as though WWW, instead of standing for World Wide Web, stands for the Wild West Web, there is no law and order. And so we need to um, help our students navigate that without sort of external rules on it. It's a big problem for modern society and therefore our students and us in distinguishing valid information. So the purpose of this community practice is to work together to identify problems across programs and institutions, which is sort of the beauty of this, this format that, that coming together like this um, and to look for solutions together. And um, this is an example, it's actually a friend of mine who teaches at West, uh, or not teaches, she's a chemistry lab technician, and we've all had experiences like this. It was something that she responded after I shared the, the, the information about this workshop on, on Facebook. She said, I was talking to a group of engineering students that were chatting about results after their experiment. And I asked them a question and they looked up an answer. And when I asked them if the site was trustworthy for that kind of info, they just looked at me blankly. This experience made me realize that educators at every level need to keep this topic at the floor all the time. You know, we, we know our, our students are tech, are tech savvy, but they're not necessarily good at some of these things um, that they need to be to be good at navigating uh, information literacy. So we're going to do a little Jamboard. Um, the link is in the chat. And uh, just quickly, uh, just to get a sense of who we are, um, I'd like you to, uh, you know, add, you can just put a, use the crayon to add a you know, if you're from Dawson, just add a little check mark or an X or a one or something. Um, and you, so you can write or you can add another um, another little sticky note, however you want to do it. And once you've done that, you can go to the second page. And if you want to add a note that just says some of the things that you've seen that your students have done. I was teaching the Pedagogy of Digital Learning course this fall, and um, I had teachers talk to me about, you know, students using using websites that were really sketchy and not realizing how sketchy they were not noticing the spelling mistakes in the in the articles for example and you know those are red flags and so it's the kind of thing that helps us see what we need to do what we need to talk to students about so i'll give you um a few minutes to do that and i'm going to go look and see uh see if i can watch what you're doing while you're doing it Okay. You are very tech savvy. So to get to the second page, you just use the arrows at the top. So you can see it says one out of two. So you can click onto two to go over there. So we can see we've got a really nice selection of people from uh, different colleges, which is really great. And also different roles, teachers, pedagogical counselors, library, other. You can use the type text tool and type in if you want to say what other is. Um, okay, coordinator, great. Um, okay, then somebody's added uh, Matan, Cégep de Matan, great. And Saint Laurent, super. I, I don't think we said that, but, and some of you may know, but the Cégep that I taught is, uh, was Cégep de Cécil, and I'm in Cécil right now, so I am very far away from most of you, except maybe my friend from Matan. <laughs> 
who were just across the water from and over a little ways. So we can see Gen Ed, uh, pre-university, technical or professional program, and a good mix of, of uh, years of teaching too. That's very interesting. Is this real or a scam? That's good. Oh yeah, lots of check marks on those. <laughs> good. So you, if you think of something as we go along, this stays open and you can add something uh, in there too. Uh, and I'll keep going, I think, um, on the PowerPoint because time goes by fast, uh, as we know when we're teaching. Is there a question and answer that needs to be addressed? Okay, yeah. Good. <laughs> I, I was looking for my mic button. No, actually, it's just uh, Jessica saying hi, Sharon, <laughs> from Matan. She was also in Sicil, which is really fun. <laughs> Jessica took over my teaching, some of my teaching, uh, my courses when uh, when I retired uh, a year ago. So that's really fun. <laughs> it's good. good to have you and everyone else who's here. Um, all right, so I will go to the next slide. Before you do, uh, Sharon, there is a yeah. question from uh, Andrea. I'm going to turn on your mic. Okay. Go ahead, Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Glad you're here. Andrea was in my class. Oh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I, I, I think I accidentally raised my hand, but hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> I'm glad to have another voice on here. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> but And it's a good test. You know this works. So uh, this is... Uh, you know, a lot of us have moved to Teams from Zoom. So to go back into Zoom was a bit of a, a learning curve again. And also we're in the mode webinar, which isn't where I taught from when I was using Zoom during the, the pandemic. So um, it's it's fun to test these different things out. So thanks. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So, you know, the line from the Wizard of Oz, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Well, the modern version of that is the algorithms, cookies and filter bubbles, oh my. So we all know that most of us spend a lot of time on social media and web browsers. Uh, you know, on screens in general, I think this data is saying about 10 hours a day. And, you know, that's not just adults, it's like young people up um, and it, it's a little frightening. So what are algorithms, rhythms? Most of you know this, they track what you look at and show you similar things. And that's mostly a good thing. Um, because we want to see the stuff we like. We don't want to see the stuff we're not interested in. Um, but the downside of that is that it cuts out things. And obviously that's okay because we can't see everything. We don't have time. Um, one of my favorite comedian lines was, you can't have everything, where would you put it? Um, well, here we have everything on the internet. And so, yeah, we need to, we need to make choices and the algorithms do make those choices for you but it tends to keep shunting us off into ever more um, tight sets of information. And um, so it can cut you off from opinions that are different from yours. Uh, and, and it might affect on, uh, you know, when you go to do searches and your perception of the world around you. Uh, so, so it's important that we understand them as teachers and that we, support our students in understanding algorithms. And cookies are just what those things are called that, that help uh, the, the algorithm find out information about you. It goes and picks up little bits of information, where you are um, and what you've been looking at and how much time you've spent on it um, so that the algorithm can make those choices about you and what, what you might want to look at. Um, there's a really, uh, not, like a quite useful, short, less than three minutes video, and Laura Lee is going to put it in the, the chat at the end, I think, because we didn't want people to go off and watch the video during the, the, um, the webinar, um, but that I found that seems good for a stage of age. You don't want one with pictures of kids or whatever, and it is cartoon, but I think it has, you know, in less than three minutes, it, it, it explains how the algorithm Fil uh, you know, narrows people into filter bubbles and the good side of it and also the bad side of it. And I think it would be a great conversation starter with students if you were trying to help them improve their information literacy. And also some of these other activities that we're going to do today, you can do with your students um, to start that conversation, to start that learning going. I don't think it's a one and done. I think this is something we need to keep working on all the time with ourselves and with our students. 
So the next thing we're going to talk about is bias. Um, so this is my own Venn diagram. I, I'm not sure it's it's uh, um, research valid, but it helped me think about it. When I read a lot about bias, it seems like there's three main sources of bias. We have our own biases that we arrive at a source with, um, what we like, what we don't like, if we're conservative or, or, or liberal minded, if we're um, young or old, uh, where, we've, where we've lived, what we like, what we think is important. So we're arriving with those. Um, there's the bias that is built into algorithms and usually that's unintentional. Algorithms are artificial intelligence and they, they um, learn. So they learn based on the data that they've been given. So if the data is taken from the 70s and 80s um, and it's skewed um, perhaps gender wise or, or, or in other fashions, then it's going to choose things based on what it learned. And so without meaning to, um, it, you know, it might um, affect what's happening, what choices it's giving you because of, because of what it's learned. Um, and content bias is the stance of the media source that you're engaging with. And we're gonna look at um, a really nice chart that, that can help you think about that and help your students think about that. Uh, so this is the first uh, little exercise to help you check your bias. Um, so you can use your phone and just point it at the QR code or Laura Lee is going to put the link in the chat. Um, it's called Gapminder. This is a free thing. It's a sort of a research project. I think it's come out of um, Great Britain. Um, and you can pick any topic and just try it. Um, what they're saying is that they tested thousands of people and they were systematically wrong about this. So it's sort of showing our bias. We, we come to this question with what we think is right. And we're pretty sure we're right. And most of the time we're not, and most other people are not right. So that's telling us something that, that there are sort of biases out there lurking at large in society that, that you know, are affecting our perception of things and the decisions we're making and the things that we're thinking about. Um, so that too is a really nice tool. So you can just go answer a few questions, take a, Take a couple minutes um, it, it, and it's a great tool to use with students because especially I would say uh, 17, 18 year old stage of students are often pretty black and white about things. They're sure about, about their convictions and what they know is right and wrong. I think that by the time they get to second or third year, they tend to, to be able to negotiate gray areas better. Um, but this is a good way to sort of bring them up against some of those assumptions that they have. I don't think I need to leave too much time. It's something that you can go on and do later. It's actually quite fun, these little quizzes to realize. And I like how they give you um, information about, um, you know, you got this wrong and here's why it's a problem. Or if you got it right, most people get it wrong and here's why it's a problem. Give me another minute to look at those. How are we doing for time, Laura Lee? You're my good time. You're good. Okay, good. You're, you're the one who's excellent at uh, keeping things on track. All right, so I'll go on to the next slide. So this is a media bias chart, and this is an old version of it. Um, what I found is now there's a bit of a paywall, but you can go look at it online, and it's much more detailed than this um, former version. Um, so you've probably, if you haven't seen it already, I'll just take a minute to explain how it works. Um, from top to bottom, top is more research, so more factual. Bottom is not research, nonsense to damaging public, uh, public discourse. Um, and from left to right, you have from liberal to conservative. And so what your, the sources that you should have your students try to focus on, and this is very American, obviously, but it does have some, some international things, I think, um, like The Guardian, uh, is the, the middle top, because that's the best researched. 
And it's really done as a research project and it's really content analysis. So it's not just somebody's opinion of where these go, they really go and um, they, there's documents um, that explain how they do this. But it's, it's just a really nice visual to help students think about media bias. So if you're asking them to look something up and they go look in Slate or they go look in the Washington Times, they're going to see different things, and um, you know how, how do they how do they realize that what they're looking at is is from a certain bias, from a certain perspective? So this is a way of helping them think about that. I've been using I use this for years and years at, at the stage of level, and it really you don't have to use it all the time, but it's a really good way to get students to start thinking about media bias. And there's links to that too in in the, in the um, resources for this webinar. So what happens when we assign a topic to students to research? This is the next little test that I want you to do, and I want you to do it on your computer. Um, so open a couple different browsers and type in the words climate change is, and you really have to put the is. One of my students told me um, when I was teaching the courses, because if you just put climate change, it stayed the same, but the minute you put is, so, you know, if you have Edge and Firefox and, and Google Chrome, um, try typing that in all three, in three different windows on your computer and see how different the results are. You can make comments in the chat if you want, if you find interesting things or funny things. So I'm hoping you're able to see some different things. So I had, I forget why, but I had looked up something that was more conservative, more right-wing on my um, on my edge, on my Microsoft edge. So the first thing that came up in my search was climate change is a hoax. And Firefox, I don't use very much. So it was sort of more neutral climate change, is it too late? Um, and in Chrome, which I use the most all the time, it says climate change is the greatest threat facing humanity today, which aligns with, with my perspective. So Chrome knew me, it knew what I thought, and it fed me the results according to its profile of me. And this is really important because that means when your students go to look for something, they're not necessarily seeing the same thing that you're seeing or is it another student is seeing and they need to be aware of that. And somebody mentioned that when um, we talked about uh, when we asked you that question in, in the sign up for the, this webinar, you know, how do we get them to go past the first six entries in, in Google search? And, you know, this is a good way to make them realize that, you know, they need to maybe go a little farther. Um, and another uh, interesting thing is that where you are. So the fact that I'm in Sitzil, I would get different results than somebody who was in Montreal, than somebody who was in Toronto. And I have a former student that I was talking to um, the other evening, and he said he's in um, Columbus, Ohio, working there. And when he's talking with his friends and they're, they're in Montreal, and they're doing a Google search on the same thing, he doesn't have any of the same responses as what they have. So where you are geographically, it's filtering out the choices that it's giving you. So once we understand this, we can help students understand this and think about ways to get around it. Um, so what does media bias look like? Um, uh, you, I want you to try this. I'm going to give you two minutes. Compare the Wikipedia entry for Fête Nationale in English and then in French. And I'm actually going to turn off my mic and camera and give you two minutes to do that.
So what did you notice? Anybody uh, want to write things in the chat? Uh, I, I mean, I think they both have great information. Or you could say something, I might too, but what I noticed was that they, they're really informative, but they focus on different things and provide different images and slightly different information. So that's just interesting. Again, it's not the one's right or one's wrong. It's just that it depends on, um, you know, where you're looking, the information that you're going to get. And this is like this everywhere. Somebody has a question. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Great. And I'm seeing some things in chat. <laughs> Climate change is making spiders bigger. I think I've actually read that somewhere. There's some validity to that. <laughs> um, okay, I'll go into the next slide. Uh, so, can your, and this is actually from a, a, the article that's linked there, and it's about children, but in this case, I think it applies really well to our students, and these are all taken from that one article, and there's a million articles out there, so, you know, this is not the end of everything, but I just thought it was a really, it had a fairly short, but information-rich article, um, and these were some tips that they gave. Scroll before you click. So search results are not listed in order of trustworthiness, so that's what we were just talking about. To determine a site's credibility or bias, you have to leave the site. And we're, we don't have a tendency to, to ha have that reflex to do that. So if you want to see if this site is accurate, go check on another site and see what they're saying about it, or maybe two or three other sites. Um, keep a, a fact-checking site bookmarked on, on, on your search engine page so, so that you can, you know, on your Google Chrome page, so that you can go really easily and quickly. Um, think like a search engine. So this is um, Boolean search techniques, you know, put it in quotations and you can, you can teach your students about Boolean search techniques. Um, and there's lots of resources to, to help you do that. Um, another thing you can do is switch it to Google News if it's a current controversial topic. Um, so you, it's just under the search bar and your results should toggle from all to news. And then at least it's gonna cut out some of the stuff that people are trying to sell you or whatever. Um, and it, obviously, Google Scholar for academic subjects is, is really useful. Restrict by domain. So you can limit your Google results by adding, for example, site uh, colon edu, edu. Keywords are key. So choose them carefully. And in this article, they had a really, the, the person, uh, the expert that uh, the person who was writing the article was talking to, asked him, if you were looking for course outlines and you wanted to limit your search to only course outlines, what two keywords would you, would you put in the search bar? And I would like people to try and chat to think, just take a guess, guess anything. What, what two keywords would you, would you put in the Google search bar if you're trying to find course outlines? He didn't get it, the guy who was writing the article. And I didn't get it either, but I thought it was really fun. Anybody, anybody? Nobody's taking your risk? Oh, somebody. Online course, good idea. Anybody else? So you're looking for course outlines. Uh, he said the, the words that you wanted were office hours. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of goofy because like you don't really want to know the office hours, but office hours wouldn't be written anywhere else except for in a course outline, right? So that would give you course outlines. It's just kind of interesting. See, it's a bit about being creative and, and, and thinking differently when you're choosing your key, key terms. Um, the, the graphic on the other side is from the American Research Libraries Association, and I just liked what it had to say, you know, authority is constructed and contextual, information creation is a process, information has value, research is really a conversation of inquiry back and forth, um, and, and uh, it's a strategic exploration, um, so it's, it's sort of changing our way of thinking about um, how we're doing this. And that's a nice definition of uh, information literacy too that they give there. Looks like we had one other thing on the chat. Oh yeah, course plus content. And that could work too. From Jennifer. So, so my best advice is 
the visit the library. I mean, we have a librarian, at least one here, you know, tell students to visit the library and use search engines that filter engines that filter out inappropriate sources. So go in through, um, you know, where, where it's been limited and you know that you're getting um, valid research based information. And, you know, do you use your college library? Do you encourage your students to use your college library? Is your college library available online? And we had this idea that we would sort of do a search and maybe post information about that online in our community of practice um, afterwards, or that you can post it about your library. Maybe you could put a link to your library. And is your library open to only your Sage of students or can other people go in? And just, it would be interesting to know. So some great resources, uh, and we'll continue to post, post resources that might be useful to you um, in your class. And please add yours or let us know what you find useful. So Media Smarts is a Canadian-based um, uh, organization that whose goal is to, to promote digital literacy. And they have all sorts of um, resources. Yes, they have stuff for elementary school age, um, it's mostly elementary and high school, but because in the rest of Canada, grade 12 is the same age as first year Seja, um, the things that are good for up to grade 12 would probably be very appropriate for first year Seja. So go and look. So they have a whole lesson plan, a plan on um, consensus or conspiracy and, and a way to get students to think about that. So there's, there's lots of things that are already prepared. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, so yeah, there's lesson plans and all sorts of resources and all of these links, uh, videos and um, yeah, uh, that, that you can go to. And I think um, we're really almost done here. I don't know my reasoning. Um, so to wind up, how do we help our students develop digital information literacy? literacy? In the community of practice, we want you to think about what are the issues you would like to know more about? What problems are you seeing? What solutions have you found? Um, and this will be continued in the community of practice. Uh, so yeah, um, thanks for participating and we look forward to exchanging ideas in the new COP on LinkedIn. So I think we have time for questions. That by the way is a hot link to the, to the community of practice. Um, I think you need to sign up. Maybe Dominic, you want to explain a little bit of that? Did you did you want to come on and um, do the acknowledgements, or do you want me to do the acknowledgements? Oh, well, briefly uh, on the community of practice, um, we will be putting in the chat the link to our webpage where all of it is explained. You see, it's a very simple process. In about three minutes, you can get um, sign up and join this community. So it's it's very very easy. Um, I know the chat seems not to work. We try to fix this, but if you want to ask any questions, please raise your hands and we'll turn on your mic. All right, it's the easiest way. Yeah. And we have time for questions, by the way. Yeah, we do, we really do. In fact, we could turn off, I, I, we, I could turn off the PowerPoint. I'll just go through the last couple um, slides. So just to acknowledge that this webinar was developed for Performa at the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, with a grant from the Ministre de l'Education et de l'Enseignement Supérieur, with special thanks to Swasen Lackel and Dominic Briard at UBS, um, and Performa and University of Sherbrooke, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the wonderful uh, digital competency framework. And this is a link to the evaluation workshop. So you can um, use your phone, and the link will be in the chat. But if you want to use your phone to, to catch that QR code, and then I think I'm going to um, exit out of this so you can see us while you ask questions and we can answer you and be human. Because that's one of the things we're trying to do in, um, now I've lost everybody, stop sharing, that's what I need to do. Um, that we're trying to do with this community of practice is to be real and humans, real humans interacting with each other. So it's not just a list of stuff that it really is uh, all of us um, sort of, making our real selves known there in that in that community. As Sharon stressed it to, throughout her webinar, this is only the start of something. It's far from being the end of it. So we hope to see you and keep the conversation going in the community of practice online. You can reach out to any of us 
on, on various platforms, whether by you have our contacts. But if you can, just have a look at the community of practice. And um, we hope that uh, we see, we hope to see you there.